In 1947, Canadian children launched an audacious chocolate bar revolt against candy manufacturers who dared to raise the price of their time-honored treat. Though their dramatic uprising was sparked by only a few pennies, it caused a national sensation and drew accusations of a communist conspiracy. and optimism. Canada had beaten fascism and outlasted the Great Depression. As Canada's victorious soldiers streamed home after World War II, jubilant Canadians were eager to begin enjoying the peace they had earned. Well, back when I was a kid, as they say, things were good. We had a lot of good fun. We weren't stuck in front of a TV and we had to make our own fun. 1947, that was a year I remember quite well. We realized that what was happening was serious, but we didn't sacrifice having a good time. The next door neighbors knew me, I knew them, everybody knew everybody's business. Like any other child or kid, we swam, we had our bicycles, we had our occasional apple fights in the fall with the apples. We'd get together on a Sunday for uh, pick-up ball games. Uh, I don't know, we seem to have a, a very, very active young life. At the time, I thought it was pretty arduous, I guess. But looking back on it, I think it was idyllic. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, nobody did. Five cents was a lot of money to us in those days. Dad would give me 25 cents. We'd spend our money on the movie, and then the rest was free to do what we wanted to do with, basically buy candy. Chocolate bar was kind of a bit of a luxury thing that uh, we used to look forward to. So you'd go buy your chocolate bar and open it up, and the chocolate bar it was a kind of a little bit of a special treat. For Canadian children, peace meant a return to fun. But soon their young lives would be changed forever as they took to the streets in a chocolate bar revolt. 1947 will long be remembered as the year of the great controversy. We want to buy big chocolate bar. And this is too high by far. Just behind the bar. By protesting, the children became targets of a national panic that ultimately stole their sweet dreams. In the post-war period, Canadians were very ready to think about the post-war as a period when the problems that had plagued them for the past 15 years would be over. Prosperity, full employment were kinds of promises that governments had made repeatedly to people during the war, so people had every reason to think that this was what would happen. Key to the wartime economy had been government control over prices and wages. Ottawa had frozen prices to fix the cost of services and materials required for the war effort and to ensure that no social unrest could undermine its efforts for Canadian victory. What this meant was that the retail price of basic commodities, food, clothing, rent, were fixed by government. So there was a ceiling above which prices were not allowed to go. Now, wages were also fixed by federal government. So what that meant was that um, people could afford to live uh, quite a reasonable standard of living with the kinds of wages that they were making. But by 1947, Parliament was phasing out these controls. What happened was the prices of the things that had previously been controlled by price controls went up. So milk was one of the first items that was decontrolled. Result for ordinary families was that increasingly these basic food items like milk and meat and cereals and so on became unaffordable. Inflation just went uh, spiraling out of control. If the furniture maker again raises his price, the prices of the other products go up. One price increase here means price increases there. A non-stop race would be on. That 
would be inflation. There had been, of course, a great uh, fear of poverty and, and, uh, and unemployment that had, had come out of the, uh, the, the Depression. And that had led, during the war itself, to people saying, we need to have a more activist government that's ready to help people. Though the country outwardly assumed an air of harmony, many conflicts boiled beneath the facade. Women, who filled the jobs vacated by men sent off to the battlefield, were now herded back into the home to begin the baby boom and restore the father and husband as head of the house. A transition difficult for some families to deal with. During the war, I guess I was the man of the family. So of course my father came home. All of a sudden I sort of, when I look back, I was sort of pushed back into the background. I was no longer the man of the family. And for some reason, one day, it was, it was I think in the fall, and uh, he said something to me. I didn't like what it was. And all of a sudden we were wrestling by the front door. And of course, neither of us wanted to hurt each other, but there was aggression there. And we uh, I hit the screen door, and we went out on the front porch, and we hit the post, and that went flying. My mother was crying and saying, I'm calling the police. But when we landed on the ground, I guess we both realized that this is foolish, you know. And then, of course, after that, I think we both had more respect for each other. But for children who neither understood nor cared for such issues, all of this meant that the price would rise on what they held most dear, chocolate. When price controls came off, what also happened was that small luxury items, like in this case, chocolate bars, became unaffordable. So there was an increase in price from chocolate bars, uh, which had been five cents, to suddenly eight cents. And this was a 60% increase in price, which made things, the kind of small luxuries that ordinary Canadians could normally afford, virtually unaffordable. In Shemanus and Ladysmith, two small Vancouver Island towns, children woke up one spring morning to discover the price of their favorite chocolate bars had risen overnight from five cents to eight cents. This day we went down and uh, usually if you had a nickel you could buy a bottle of pop, uh, ice cream cone or a chocolate bar. And all of a sudden we went in and bango, chocolate bars, eight cents. And that just hit us like a something a slap in the face. I mean, we just couldn't understand this. Going up to eight cents constrained our finances to the limit that we, uh, it was getting beyond what we could actually handle at the age that we were, at our ages, you know. I think I said, it could have been somebody else, but I think I said, well, we should protest this. So we made some placards and somehow we got back down to the wigwam, which was an ice cream part I think you see on TV of 50 years ago. And we picketed that, much to the disgust of the owner. Made a hell of a lot of noise, and uh, uh, people probably laughed at these kids were stirring up a row for nothing. I would guess there would have been probably 30 kids in the parade, but it seemed a big crowd to us at the time, that uh, we were well supported by our own group. Everything was uh, a very high heed, uh, uh, and a lot of kids. There was a lot of signs. They were more just hollering out the slogans that seemed to be part of that episode. Slogans like, down with eight cent chocolate bars and, and uh, don't be a sucker. Nobody walked from place to place, you know. When there was something over here, jeepers, a wave went over there and went over there. You were just running in waves. Uh, if something was over this way, then a bunch ran that way and then they ran that way. Uh, uh, it, uh, it was reasonably exciting. It got exciting. My recollection was it was, it was very spontaneous. And uh, it was just a case of milling around and grumbling amongst ourselves about what are we going to do about this price of chocolate bars? This is outrageous. And uh, that first day, it didn't seem to be too much organization uh, other than a lot of anger and, and uh, you know, it was just an unreal action. The only person in the crowd that had a car would be Parker. And so we convinced Parker we should go back into town with his car and um, protest. This car, it was kind of a strange looking thing. It had a kind of a big high cab with a single seat and a little tiny trunk on the back. So when this 
chocolate bar protest come along, well, sure, let's use my car. It was an old, an old car, but it, to us, it was great. So down at one of our neighbor's place, Parker took his car down, and we doctored it up with slogans all over it. You know, it wasn't a, a big car, but uh, we covered every, pretty well every square inch of it with pretty crude printing and whatnot. I can't recall the specific slogans, but they were, don't buy chocolate bars, and they can't do this to us, and that type of thing, you know. And then we drove into Ladysmith, and there still seemed to be a lot of kids milling around the wigwam, even at that time. And then uh, we just started our parade. We had somewhere around nine people on his car. And that This nine figure sticks in my mind that we had on his car because it was a bit of a challenge to get that many people on it. And we were on the running boards, we were on the front bumper, we were uh, on the fenders in the trunk. On the, we were all over this car. And we were going up and down town screaming out that you can't do, they can't do this to us. They can't do this to us. Then we're not going to ever buy another chocolate bar. They can't do this to us. So it would have been um, a pretty, probably unruly scene because there was no, uh, what do you call, parade marshal or anything like that. Pint-sized pandemonium ensued. There would have been, oh, 40 kids in front of the wigwam. And this reporter went in, uh, uh, bought a chocolate bar. Uh, uh, there was a lot of noise going around uh, at that time. And uh, when he, he came out, he had the chocolate bar in his hand, uh, uh, taking the wrapping off. Uh, they uh, took the chocolate bar away from him. I remember he had it up to uh, eat it, just to, to taunt the kids, uh, I'm sure. And they, they grabbed the chocolate bar out of his uh, hand and uh, um, tore the wrapper off from it, threw it onto the ground and jumped on it, so uh, nobody ate that chocolate bar. But heavens, they put him on the ground, too. As far as the adults go, I think uh, they, they were more amused at it than, uh, than they were um, objecting or uh, negative about it. I, I don't recall any adult uh, negativity, but uh, I think there was a lot of interest and just idle curiosity. What offended me, I think, at the time, and the other kids, was that it was done out of the blue, just bang. No, if, and, or please, or this, do it. And also, it's an opportunity to stir up trouble, so we, we rose to that opportunity. Within days, the chocolate bar protests spread across Vancouver Island and reached Victoria where hundreds of chanting, sign-toting children gave politicians the surprise of their lives by storming the provincial legislature demanding five-cent chocolate bars. Government business shut down as security personnel chased elusive small fry through the halls. As word of the protest reached the mainland, Vancouver children followed suit and went on strike against eight-cent chocolate bars vowing not to purchase a single bar until the price was restored to five cents. Sometimes police had to break up protests that got out of hand. Some of the youngsters became unruly on entering one store to voice their disapproval of higher-priced chocolate bars, and it became necessary to call local police to maintain order. Later, a number of children visited the home of the proprietor of one store and stuck posters on the windows. The wildfire spread across the country. Protests occurred in Calgary, Edmonton, Regina, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal, Quebec City, and throughout the Maritimes as children filled the streets with makeshift signs and improvised songs denouncing expensive chocolate bars. The Five Cent War was on. Signs of revolt over rising prices are spearheaded by the Dominion Small Fry. They say candy sellers are sabotaging the sweet tooth, and what this country needs most is a good five-cent chocolate bar. Across the country, over a hundred leaders of the Lollipop Brigade charge that the higher prices are unfair to Canada's candy chewers. So they stage the most unusual strike on record. Did we have any ideas about exp it, it expanding across the country? No. Uh, uh, the furthest from our minds, it was just a... Basically, like I said before, an opportunity to get away from the school for, for a couple hours. Uh, we wouldn't have been so egotistical, I think, to think that it was going to be picked up by anybody else. By boycotting chocolate bars in cities and towns across Canada, 
kids hope to deliver a knockout punch to the nefarious eight cent bar. From coast to coast, kids had taken matters into their own hands. I think that we believed that we could do something about the cost of the chocolate bar going up. So we said we'll make a few signs, we'll walk up the street, and we'll sing. We'll do what we can, our part, to see if it helps. We always got together, we played together, and sitting on somebody's front veranda, we discussed it and decided that we should do something about this. And maybe that's where the ball got rolling. I think it was a, a group effort and a, a group idea. And we made signs on the back of cardboard boxes and thumbtacked them to sticks and tree limbs or whatever and um, said, we're going to march. We're going to go over to Mary O'Donnell's store and we'll just show them our displeasure. And then as we talked about it, we said, maybe we should sing a little song. And we got, it just came out of us naturally, I guess. <laughs> we want a five cent chocolate bar, eight cents is going too darn far. We want a five cent chocolate bar, oh we want a five cent bar. That was it. All you had to do was just mention, in this case, candy strike, and word of mouth it would spread from the east to the west to the north to the south. And of course everybody would say, where is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? And the day before the actual strike, everybody knew. When I stop really and think about it, we had a lot of kids in that march. We were in single file, hitting drums or hitting pans, and, and then, you know, kind of saying that this was unfair, this wasn't uh, right. We were yelling, you know, unfair, price of candy raise, support us, and different things. We were very boisterous and what have you. And of course the people along the sideway, they would applaud and say yes, because in those days people never got annoyed. I, a lot of the adults kind of laughed when we went by. We didn't appreciate that too much because this was serious business for us. I don't believe they took us that seriously. However, it was written up in the local paper and the message was there. The message that we wrote to the Northern Light asking that it be considered at a meeting of the town council. So the, the message went out through the media and through us. It was rather an exciting time, really. My parents just kind of looked at me as if to say, you know, it's okay, just don't go too far with this thing. But uh, your parents didn't give you any objection, did they? My dad was a lawyer, I was all right. You were all right. <laughs> you could do no wrong in this town. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he, he, he was says, a wonderful man too. He says, I'll defend you, go ahead and do it. That's right. What do you think? Wow. That is a Isn't that great one. Yes, I like that very like much. That. What that are you working on? Uh, we we want to find anything yet. Bar. School children of three secondary schools followed the example of young people in other parts of Canada by staging a mass meeting to protest against the eight cent chocolate bar. Bill Beatty of the CBC was at the meeting and he reports to you now. During the past week, the candy bar strikers have been circulating pledge cards. And they claim that so far, over 3,000 of the younger generation have signed the pledge not to buy eight-cent bars. The climax of their campaign came with the parade through the west end of the city this afternoon. Students from three secondary schools joined in and gathered for a mass meeting, many of them carrying colorful placards bearing such candy bar slogans as knuckle down for nickel bars, candy's dandy, but eight cents isn't handy. And eight cents is a big bite out of a sweet tooth. The strikers seem to feel that this latest thing in buyer strikes should be just a start, that it should win action from their parents and perhaps eventually get something done. The meeting wound up with a stirring marching song. We want a five-cent chocolate bar. Eight cents is going to darn far. We want a five-cent chocolate bar. Oh, we want a five-cent bar. We went, I guess, as far as we could go, and we eventually wound up at Lori Harrison's convenience store. He came out and he said, kids, he said, look, I know it's an awful thing, but for today only, 
I'm going to keep the price at five cents. And we all went, hooray, hooray, we had finally accomplished something. I can't even remember how many chocolate bars I bought that day, but I'm sure any nickels I had in my pocket went for a chocolate bar. So does that mean you're really going to boycott candy? I really am, yes. As candy bar sales fell sharply under the child-led boycott, chocolate manufacturers argued that with the elimination of labor and price controls, they had no choice but to raise the price of candy bars. The largest chocolate companies in the land quickly scrambled to defend themselves in the press and duck criticism as the public cheered the children. Five cent chocolate bars just aren't possible now. We at Willard's know you aren't happy about this candy bar situation. Neither are we, but we can't help ourselves. Frankly, sincerely, that's the situation. Less honorable candy merchants attempted to bribe protest ringleaders with cut rate or even free chocolate bars. But the trouble with these walkouts is that there is always somebody who's ready to dip into the piggy bank and let the gang down. If somebody wanted to buy a chocolate bar, they would have gone a lot farther away, maybe down at the end of town, but they'd have never bought a chocolate bar up in the main street. It just wasn't an item. Canada's premier candy baron, Arthur Ganong of the venerable Ganong Brothers Chocolatiers, visited Calgary and witnessed firsthand the protests there. Canada's youngsters have hardened their hearts against the eight cent bar and will not be moved by any array of statistics. He would know. After all, he invented the chocolate bar and was the first to set its price at five cents. The story behind the chocolate bar invention was that my grandfather, Arthur Ganong, and then one of the senior production uh, people, uh, George Enzer, uh, used to go on fishing trips. And uh, on the fishing trips, they'd want to take along a little bit of their product to munch on. And they get tired of having mushy chocolates in the pockets of their, their jackets. And uh, they came up with the idea that said, well, to go on our fishing trips, why don't we put about enough into a wrapper that would be what we'd want to eat to satisfy ourselves as an interim snack? The uh, idea came along, well, well, if it's convenient for us, why wouldn't this be convenient for other consumers? And that's where they began to market the first five-cent chocolate bar in Canada. And it was a chocolate nut bar. Uh, chocolate has been around for a long time. Uh, it started back about, believe it or not, they say 3,000 years ago. And it was developed in uh, Mexico and, and parts of South America by the Mayans. They developed this cocoa bean that they picked from the trees and they made a drink from it. They made a cocoa and chili concoction. And then the Spaniards, Cortez, came over and they were using this. Uh, they were calling it uh, chocolatil, which was a liquid, and the beans as a currency. The Europeans were so taken with this that they decided to take some of the beans back to Europe and try and uh, cultivate them there. Uh, but that process took many, many years because uh, the cocoa tree only grows really uh, 20 degrees either side of the equator. It therefore became a very elite type of substance and only the rich in Europe could afford to buy it. It, it wasn't the flavor or the taste in the mouth, it was the buzz they got from drinking it. Uh, chocolate and cocoa has a certain amount of caffeine and phenylethamine. What that does is it lifts your spirits and it makes you feel good. Whenever you have a, a small piece of chocolate and you're sitting back enjoying it and you're wondering why you're feeling good, that's why. And that's the beginning. Today, the beans are, are harvested and brought into a manufacturing facility where they're roasted. It then goes through a series of grinding exercises and then a mixing exercise which would uh, add sugar and uh, in the case of milk chocolate uh, would add uh, milk products. From there you extract the cocoa butter, you add sugar and vanilla, then you put the cocoa butter back into it and uh, voila there's chocolate. Oh my secret chocolate bar is just such a treat. Creamy, me dark and velvety, you wrap it you'll see. Don't deprive me of my milky My secret chocolate bar will lift me up high With the taste sensation that you just can deny It will please you, it will please me Three meat taste of delight 
As I recall, to have a chocolate bar was really quite delightful. Ooh, creamy, Just good. the smell of that nice chocolate as we opened up the wrapper was good. And uh, we were lucky when we had a, a nickel to spend on a bar. The five cent war continued as kids across Canada stayed on strike for the chocolate they loved. Mmm, delicious. And we were fired up, and we weren't fired up from sugar or what have you, like from a candy bar. We wanted something to be done right. The decent thing was not to raise the price of a chocolate bar, but of course, decent things don't always happen. At the zenith of its popularity, the children's uprising fell victim to the times. On the occasion of what was presumed would be the pinnacle of visibility for the nationwide protest, a march on Parliament Hill by hundreds of young people, charges of communist influence rocked the Five Cent Warriors, as they were accused of being led by sinister forces. There were some in Canada who saw the children's plea for cheaper candy as only the first step down the path of communist tyranny. First, Russia. Next, chocolate. And then, the world. World. As children protested in 1947 for a five-cent chocolate bar, the Toronto Evening Telegram blasted the strikers as communist dupes. Chocolate bars in a world revolution may seem pools apart, but to the devious communist mind, there is a close relationship. They don't realize it, but the indignant students parading with their placards demanding a five-cent candy bar had become another instrument in the communist grand strategy of the creation of chaos. The newspaper alleged that communists were at the controls of the candy bar boycott. The Toronto Telegram was perhaps the most conservative newspaper in Toronto. Uh, it had uh, a long-standing anti-communist bias. We also know that in 1947, the Toronto Telegram was managed by John Bassett, who was himself a failed Conservative Party candidate in earlier elections and uh, uh, was himself uh, anti-communist who would later on in the 1950s go on to purchase the telegram and make it into a, a full-blown uh, anti-communist uh, newspaper. Though many youth clubs were supportive of the fight against the eight-cent chocolate bar, the telegram zeroed in on a little-known group, the National Federation of Labour Youth, NFLY, accusing it of using the children to bring about a revolution. The goals of the National Federation of Labour Youth was to provide young people, young workers, with an organization where they could uh, exercise their uh, attitudes towards uh, democracy, towards the government, towards Canada, towards the world. And the NFLY was particularly interested in this chocolate bar strike because it was a manifestation amongst young people who saw themselves in the position where they were being uh, stuffed and uh, they jumped into the fray, and uh, we jumped in with them right away. The paper accused Enfly of being nothing more than a communist front. These front organizations with misleading names have a very definite place in the communist program. I would say that the Toronto Evening Telegram would single the Enfly out to land based uh, on, on the chocolate bar strike because of the fact that we were an organization that had relations with the Communist Party of Canada. The term Communist Front um, is a term used by anti-communists to discredit organizations in which communists were active. Um, what it suggests is that everything that uh, communists do, all the community activities and the labor union activities and so on that communists were involved in, were um, directed by either the Central Executive Committee of the Communist Party in Canada, or probably, they mean, by Moscow. Charges of communism were no laughing matter at the dawn of the Cold War. The establishment of Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe after World War II provided the backdrop for an emerging fear of a red menace in Canada, a fear propelled by events of the previous year. A Russian embassy clerk named Igor Gusenko stole over 100 documents from the Soviet secret cipher room in Ottawa. 
These documents expose the biggest espionage ring ever revealed in the Western world. Tonight, Igor Gusenko makes his first live television appearance. For security reasons, we've disguised Mr. Gusenko's voice as well as his appearance as he tries to stump the panel with his front page story. The Gusenko uh, revelations about spying, Soviet spying going on in the, the West began the Cold War because it became public that there was a Soviet uh, spy ring operating in Western countries. And that was followed almost immediately by Winston Churchill's famous speech in Fulton, Missouri in March of 1946, in which he talked about an iron, iron curtain, curtain having descended across, across Central Europe. That Iron Curtain speech is uh, often credited as the beginning of the Cold War, but the public information about Gosenko's revelation was the real beginning of, the, of a turning in the tide that we would call the, the beginning of the Cold War. Gosenko's daring theft touched off an immediate RCMP investigation to check the secret information. National secrets were being sent to Russia. Hundreds of arrests were made on charges of espionage and treason. During 1946, 20 espionage trials were held by a royal commission in Ottawa. Among those convicted were former MP Fred Rose. The fact that Fred Rose was named by Gozenko helped to create an environment in which Cold War sentiment, Cold War hysteria in some ways, would be much more acceptable. After all, here was an elected communist politician, an elected communist uh, a party member who seem to have, have uh, betrayed his country. One of the things that resulted uh, from the trial and conviction of Fred Rose, um, who was clearly identified as a communist uh, and as a member of this spiring, was that communism became increasingly identified in the popular imagination with espionage. People who were identified as communists and who were active in community organizations were demonized. Uh, in the press, by government officials, uh, and uh, increasingly uh, in, in, in a very popular way in the media. Communism. What is it? What strange manner of reasoning brought it about? Political authorities in Canada feared communism because it represented an entirely different way of organizing society. It represented uh, a much greater focus on leveling, of incomes, the extremes of wealth and poverty would be eradicated or, or, or limited. And, um, and the whole nature of political authority, of course, would be uh, changed as well. Rather than coming from the top, it would come from the bottom, from, from people. This at least was the theory of, of, uh, of communism. In this system, the value of individual man diminishes sharply, and the state is all important. The state will run his political life for him, his business life, his social life. And people were just shocked when they were confronted with the fact they were being accused of being used by a foreign power in Moscow or something, you know, so. Well, when I uh, found out about the Eastern protest and the, the communist plot uh, aspect of it, I was completely shocked really taken aback on, on that uh, charge of aspect because the whole uh, event as far as we were out here it was just a protest uh, there were no absolute political connotations or anything to it it was just a bunch of school kids protesting the, an inflationary rise in the cost of a product that we used to buy I don't recall ever hearing that word communism at that age as far as communists, uh, the only thing we would have known about that is through the movies. And in the movies, they were just the bad guys. No, we were certainly not in any way, shape, or form uh, uh, aware of any communists uh, being part of it. People didn't uh, look up to a communist, that is for sure. But it wasn't something we talked about uh, at all, really. But uh, uh, there was no adult around there to uh, be any type of a communist leader for uh, this group because we didn't seem to have a leader. No, no, I am not, never have been a communist. I spent a lot of time trying to find out exactly 
where it started, who started it, where we get in on it. And then I realized in the end, it doesn't much matter, except from the point of view that obviously there was a preparation of the young people of Canada to, to act on this question. But spontaneity is one thing. Left to itself, it doesn't produce very much. You have to add a little consciousness to it. But we didn't take it over. We signed nobody up in the chocolate bar right? We were trying to help the people who started it win a victory. That was our only objective. The Toronto Telegram had accused the candy strikers of being led by communists. But the specter of Canada's children gone wild drew concern from an even more powerful force. In the immediate post-Second World War years, the RCMP became very focused on the perceived problem of juvenile delinquency. Play a little ball in the street and some flatfoot breaks it up. Just stand around horsing with the gang and old Jangra runs you off. He doesn't own the street. Where's the guy supposed to go? The RCMP believed that young people who had known disruption in their lives, uh, the war, for example, and the Depression, would be more susceptible to leftist political influence. Stuart Taylor Wood, who was the RCMP commissioner from 1938 into the early 1950s, was very focused on ideology and on trying to shape public opinion. And it was linked to the ideology or ideological confrontation of the day because the campaign that the RCMP took on was to make the police out to be friends of young people. It was intended to deal with the perceived problems of young people going astray, but also to deal with the perceived problem of, of communist influence amongst the, uh, the young people. One of our jobs is to help lost boys like you. Freddy discovers that the policeman wants to help him and to be friendly. We see then this tremendously stepped up sense of, uh, of involvement in security issues. We see the RCMP reaching further into the Canadian population to try to ascertain who was not um, one of them, essentially, who was not with the system. You refuse to answer that question, is that correct? You People are generally familiar question. with anti-communism as it happened in the United States. Because later, there was such a great visibility with Senator McCarthy and, and you know, the, the Republican Committee and so on that went on there uh, and that didn't happen in Canada that we somehow assume that the kind of witch hunts that went on in the United States didn't happen in Canada. But that's not true. In Canada, the process was very covert and very secretive, much more bureaucratic. So anti-communism went on and kind of behind the scenes. That was one reason why the war over the five cent candy bar is so unusual in, in Canadian history because it was a case where the issue was fought out in the public arena. It was ostensibly at least outside of the, uh, the hands of the RCMP. It was being fought out on the pages of the newspapers and in public discussion and, on, and demonstrations and the like. That in itself raises suspicions. Was it something that the RCMP actually planted deliberately with the idea that if they couldn't deal with the issue themselves, they could bring it out into an arena where it could be addressed, where public opinion would discipline this movement, would prevent the, the war essentially from being won by the kids. We know that the RCMP did in some cases, use sympathetic journalists in order to get across their point of view where they couldn't otherwise do it on their own. If the RCMP was going to use a newspaper in its campaign to win public opinion over the five cent chocolate bar, it would have found a perfect vehicle in the Toronto Telegram. Even during the war, when the Soviet Union had been an ally, like the RCMP, the Toronto Telegram had insisted that the Soviet Union was not a true ally and that the communists would certainly turn in, in the end. I would say, as a matter of fact, that the subsequent attacks on the NFL by the right-wing pukey uh, Toronto Evening Telegram, inspired by the RCMP, was designed to break that unity across the country that was giving the chocolate bar strike such uh, 
prominence and such power. So uh, what better way to end the strike and get back to the 8 cent chocolate bar than to uh, find a way to draw a line between the NFLY and the thousands of young children and their parents who supported it. Protests became few and far between as formerly supportive clubs and communities deserted the candy strikers and parents feared their children might become communists. You know, kids uh, can go so far, but in the end, uh, they have to live at the dinner table with their parents and, uh, and they also have a lot of respect for their parents. So uh, when, when, when the August uh, uh, telegram uh, prints this kind of stuff, then the uh, children or parents, if they say so, it must be true. I mean, there is that sort of naivety about the major press, but for children, it was a very devastating thing. So they just uh, folded up and the NFLI packed it in with them. The five cent war had run out of steam. Prices weren't coming down. Manufacturers wouldn't lose profits at the hands of children. And public opinion turned against the kids. Even though the price of candy bars remained at eight cents, I think we were proud of the fact that we, we stood up and, and protested and stood up for our rights as children. And uh, we, we went away with the fact that we tried to do something. We tried to change something, even though it didn't change in the end. I think that that candy bar strike uh, set a stage for me for later uh, in my years that uh, if there was a cause and I felt strongly about it, I, I would uh, investigate it further and, uh, and then I would uh, be heard. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't think that uh, uh, we would have gone through the effort that we did go through if we thought that it was for nothing. Uh, you know, we were very, very naive. There's no question about it. As Bert said earlier, there, uh, we were naive, uh, but uh, we still thought that, uh, uh, you know, if we all stuck together, uh, why shouldn't we? We did learn that uh, things don't stay the same. And, um, and then I, I think it gave us a sense of, of uh, sort of that we did have the ability to speak out when we saw something that uh, we didn't feel was right. Now, whether we were right or not, it, does, it was beside the point. But uh, we did have the ability to speak out. We made our first steps to stand up for, would you use the word justice or whatever. And uh, in that term, we wanted to go out and further our endeavors as we went through life and be a success. Fascinating to know that, or to reflect that, what one little thing happens, or when some little thing happens, there's ripples going out everywhere. Sometimes they stop short, sometimes they go forever. As far as I'm concerned, that the it was difficult. There were problems, they hit the family, but the, uh, the uh, vision was worth the price. Canadian children, idealistic and innocent in pursuit of a just cause, had been undone by powers beyond their understanding or control. Chocolate bars never again returned to five cents. Boy, oh boy, this is, this is great. Now that's my version of a chocolate bar. Well, here's to a five cent chocolate oh, bar forever. Cheers. Yeah. If only these were still a nickel. Wow. Yeah, if only they were still a nickel. God, that's great stuff. Those days are long gone. Never again for a nickel. But the taste is still there. The taste is still there. And so are the memories. Remember when you could buy a good-sized chocolate bar for a nickel? Then the bars started to shrink in size, and at the same time, the price went up, and they blamed it on the high price of sugar and then on the high price of chocolate. Unfair? Well, Danny Cooper of St. Antoine School in suburban Montreal thinks so, and he's doing something about it. When we found 12-year-old Danny in Bellavo's candy store, he was encouraging his friends in a candy boycott. 
He was serious about it, too. I strongly insist and suggest to all responsible people for the high cost of chocolate to take drastic measures and abolish these suspicious reasons given to us and the voters, the intolerable high cost of this appreciated food. So does that mean you're really going to boycott candy? I really am, yes. Chocolate bar, yes, we want a five cent bar. Come with me, my sweet Marie. Come and dance with O. Henry. We want a five cent chocolate bar, yes, we want a five cent bar. Once there was a wildfire king. He was supposed to know everything. We went to him for advice, and he told us to bring down the price. Oh, we want a five-cent chocolate bar. Eight cents is going too darn far. We want a five-cent chocolate bar. Yes, we want a five-cent bar. Those were the days, though. <laughs> What do we have for candy when uh, during the war in those three years? Uh, whoa, 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 whoa,